Hello, everyone. Before we launch into another episode of the Falconry Chronicles podcast, I want to give a quick shout out to a couple of our newer sponsors, being the Archives of Falconry. And the Archives wanted me to let you all know that registration is now live for the next Spring Rendezvous, which is going to be held April 18th to the 20th in Boise. And the theme of this year's rendezvous is the Quarry of Falconry. The event includes a film screening that's hosted by a renowned wildlife photographer and cinematographer, an amazing lineup of speakers, a special reception and discussion about avian flu, the Wall of Remembrance induction, and also a banquet and more. If you want to be a part of this awesome event, just head to falconry.org and register. I also want to give a quick shout out to our other new sponsor being Masters of the Skies. And Masters of the Skies is dedicated to educating the public about our native raptor species in general and about the art of falconry. Located in eastern Pennsylvania and traveling all over the northeastern United States, Masters of the Skies offers hands-on, interactive raptor experiences to anyone who's interested in birds of prey and falconry. Their educational program can be run in a variety of venues and in multiple languages and has been described as fun and engaging and consistently receives five-star reviews online. Masters of the Skies believes that every falconer is also a conservationist and they're inspired by falconer-led projects such as the North American Grouse Partnership and the Peregrine Fund. Masters of the Skies also promotes the conservation of our native birds of prey through the practice of falconry and strive to create connections with other institutions that share the same core principles and values because raptor conservation happens only when we all work together. Masters of the Skies also offers falconry-based bird abatement services all over Pennsylvania. So if you're interested in finding out more, just head to mastersoftheskies.org or search Masters of the Skies on Facebook and Instagram. Now, on to this new episode of the Falconry Chronicles podcast. And then, so she's running in circles. I'm trying to, like, follow this chaos. And um, she finally flushes it one more time. And it goes all the way across the hydro line again. And I was like, this is wild. So I just stood there. I watched the... The rabbit, you know, crossing the hydro line. I watch the dog right on the rabbit's tail. And then I'm just watching Storm come out of the tree and just like a bullet straight directly to this hair. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back for another episode of the Falconry Chronicles podcast. And appreciate you joining us for another episode that's going to feature some falconry from Canada. And this episode features Brittany Gravel and she talks about some of her experiences hawking snowshoe hares in Canada and flying red tails amongst other things and I'm going to go ahead and launch right into this episode and hope you enjoy. Here we go. Yeah, remind me again where you're located at. So I live in Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. I'm about, I don't know, what would it be, like four, five hours north of Minneapolis. Okay. On the north shore of Lake Superior. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't know um, if you've heard me say it or not, but I've said it plenty times on plenty of times on this podcast. I'm I'm pretty much a geographical moron. So, um, you know, trying to remember where everybody's located relative to where and all that, it's uh, usually pretty tough for me, <laughs> unless I've been there several times or whatever. So, yeah. So, I mean, have you lived there pretty much the the most, like the majority of your life? Or Yeah, I was born and raised in Thunder Bay. I uh, went away to British Columbia for school, and then I came back here because it was just too big over there. <laughs> Always missed Ontario. <laughs> so it's pretty sparse where you're at. Not a very big population or Thunder Bay has a population. I think right now we're at like 110,000 people, but it's like a really small town feel. Everybody's spread out really far. Gotcha. So yeah, it sounds fairly similar to a couple of the places around where I live, you know, in Indiana. There's um there's a lot of, I don't know, there's certain areas where there's a lot of people in 
a small area, but I mean, there's, there's a lot of very um, rural areas around here too. So I rounded by bush here. (laughs) Yeah. Cool. Well, so, I mean, as far as, you know, whenever you, you started getting into all this, I mean, where did you, or did, did you kind of do a traditional like mentorship or did you have anybody that was close to or up in that area that you, that you kind of got in with whenever you started getting into all this stuff or. So when I started in falconry, well, even before that, two years before I started, I was just on Facebook and I saw um, this girl. She was posting pictures with her and her red tail hawk. And I didn't know her. And I thought, you know what? I'm just, how do I get to do this? Like, how how is she doing this? How can I figure this out? So I just randomly sent her a message And that day she said, hey, why don't you come over? So I went over to her place and she introduced me to her red tail hawk. And I was like, this is wild. I had no idea you could even do this. I'm like, okay, how do I get involved? So that whole first winter I spent hunting with her and her red tail hawk. And I'm like, oh, I have to do this. This is just incredible. So she introduced me to her sponsor who lives three hours north of Thunder Bay. He lives in uh, Long Lac, Ontario. And he, we went up once hunting with him. Jen brought her red tail um, and he had a female red tail. And so we went up for the day and hunted with him. And we were driving back um, from the field back to his place. And he goes, so what do you think? I'm like, oh, I have to do this. He's like, okay, well, let's get you started. (laughs) I'm like, oh, yes. It was that easy for you, huh? (laughs) It was pretty easy, actually. I think Jen had a harder time with it. But yeah, it all kind of clicked for me really fast. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny. I've I've had this conversation many times with many other falconers, but you know, it's funny. You know, some people are be like, "Oh, you want to do this? All right, cool, let's do it." You know, whatever. And then and then other people, you know, are like, "All right, well, um, let's you know check back at the end of the season." <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and, and then you never hear back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. And and uh, yeah, I mean, I I pretty much had to get out pretty consistently three to four at least you know times a week for a full season before I earned my sponsorship or at least I felt like I earned my sponsorship um, but as we all know everybody is completely different in what they expect and can reasonably also expect out of other people you know I mean I depending on where you're at and depending on you know, who's willing to sponsor you and stuff. I mean, it realistically, you know, especially if your sponsor's like, you know, three hours away or something, I mean, it it can be hard to, you know, make the three hour drive multiple times a week to get out with somebody for a, for a full season. So. Yeah. And in Thunder Bay, there's really only me and Jen are, I think there's maybe one more girl, but I don't know if she actively hunts her hawks. I think she does more bird abatement stuff, but we're the only two falconers here. And the only person that was able to sponsor us was three hours away. So there's not very many of us in this area. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, and well, there are benefits to that. At least you're not having to, you know, have a lot of competition for, (laughs) you know, spots and stuff. Not at all. (laughs) (laughs) So as far as the areas around where you're at, I mean, have you had any issues finding much in the way of, of, uh, you know, grounds and properties to, to hunt on or anything or? Well, the one amazing thing about Canada, I guess, Ontario, um, is we are surrounded by crown land. So there's lots of private land around the city and stuff, but I live, uh, 20 minutes outside of Thunder Bay and I'm surrounded by crown land everywhere. So it's not hard to find a place. Uh, It's harder to find a flyable area because the boreal forest is so thick. um, It's really hard to find good spots to be able to fly. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, (laughs) Yeah, it seems like if if an area hasn't just been completely industrialized anymore, 
there's it seems like it's hard to find like a quote unquote perfect spot anymore like either there's too much construction or you know (laughs) land has just been completely plowed under or or yeah or it's just for whatever reason there's just something wrong it's either too thick or it's too it's got too many hazards around it or or whatever you know the case is at least that's the way it's gotten you know here in the states yeah we're lucky we don't have too much of that going on here (laughs) Yeah. So you you guys haven't really faced a, a whole lot of um you know the the like the real estate commercialization aspect of things yet where you're at? No. It's probably going to start, but it's hard to explain. Northwestern Ontario is huge, and I think one of the main things would be um like forestry operations. So we, there's tons of logging up here that, and yeah, not too much industrialization just around the city and stuff, but we try to get really far away from there. (laughs) Yeah, no, that makes sense. And, um, yeah, I mean, typically at least I know here in the States, it seems like most of the really big, I don't know, influx of like population growth, only really occurs in places where there's big companies moving in and building, you know, facilities or whatever. And, or if, you know, (laughs) you just are unfortunate enough to live in areas where people are just like migrating into to try and get out of another area like out West or something like that. But, uh, you know, I mean, I, (laughs) I'm sure it probably takes more of a, of a unique, uh, I don't know how how to word it. More of a unique individual as far as like what they are wanting in the ways of you know like the surroundings and you know the climate and stuff to want to live that far north <laughs> and and have it be that cold and and that snowy and stuff all the time. So yeah, it's tough. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, just from what I've heard described about that area. I'm not really sure I'd want to live there, (laughs) but so right now we're going, everything's finally turned green and we're having like summer temperatures and I can't wait till it gets cold again. (laughs) In other words, you're one of those unique personalities. I am for sure. Yeah, Yeah. I love it up here. Yeah. I mean, if, if you just hate being cold most of the time, it seems like it's not the place where you'd want to be. <laughs> we really dislike it when it's minus 40 for a week or two and you can't get out flying. You can't even go outside. Your nostrils freeze together. Yeah, that part's not very fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as like just how things are there and with the progression of, I mean, so you live in a, in a province then that, actually it requires this, like a sponsorship. I mean, I know things are kind of different from province to province, like in Canada, kind of how they are from state to state here. But I mean, nationally, of course, here we, we require, you know, a, a sponsorship. But I know if things have kind of progressed differently in Canada, like how are things up there then with all that? No, in Ontario, we have to do, I think our uh, sponsorship program is very similar to a lot of the states. Um, so yeah, up here you have to do a two-year apprenticeship. Like I've I've talked to you know a couple of of you all up there now, and um, it's it's always interesting hearing, like I said, the differences between here and there and everywhere, and um, you know what you guys have had to kind of go through as time has has gone on. You know, as far as your regulation changes and you know some of the different things with all that but i mean have you ran into anything or any issues like with all that i mean i know it's it's probably like i said more difficult for other people to find sponsors than others because yeah i mean of how spread out and sparse a lot of those provinces are but yeah i think uh it is hard for people to find sponsors well in ontario well i'm in northwestern ontario so the majority of my club is 15 hours south of me. (laughs) So I'm really far away from the rest of the club. (laughs) Gotcha. Yeah. And as far as like, 
I mean, how often do you all meet up? I mean, or since you're so spread out, I mean, do you still have like an annual meet or anything that you guys try and do or? Yeah, well, COVID, of course. So we didn't for <laughs> yeah. a couple of years, but uh, last January, uh, the Ontario Hawking Club was able to hold their first one since COVID. Um, and I did the 19 hour trip down there <laughs> and it was the best four days hunting that I've ever had. <laughs> it was great because we were hunting cottontails. I don't have cottontails up here. Yeah, that's, that's funny because, I, like I said, I geographically, it's it's one thing to look at a, at a at an area on a map and try and you know <laughs> kind of visualize or, or comprehend how long it takes. I mean, 19 hours for me, that would get me to like southwestern Wyoming from southern Indiana. So it's it's kind of, you know, like I said, just <laughs> visualizing how big some of these places are is different from comprehending how long it takes to get from point A to point B. Yeah. Well, I got to go all the way around Lake Superior. So it is the largest freshwater lake in the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So basically uh, most, most of your travel hiccups then are just more geographical obstacles then and that you have to go around. Yeah. It'd probably be a little bit shorter, but I don't know. Maybe it'd still be, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so was that the first, you said that was, a, was that the first time you had gotten a chance to, to hunt cottontails then? Yes, because that was actually my second meet. I haven't been in falconry for very long. I've been a falconer. I started my apprenticeship in 2018, I believe. Um, so I did get to go to a meet that year. And then we weren't able to have any um, until this past January. And I did bring my red tail down. And yeah, that was the first time that I actually hunted cottontails with my own bird. It was wild. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hunt any differently at the meet than how you have to hunt where you're located now? I mean, do you mainly hunt yours out of a tree or off the fist or? Yeah, no, out of the tree. So that in that aspect, it was the same. Um, the difference being I wasn't wearing snowshoes, <laughs> which was <laughs> awesome. I was just in my boots <laughs> um, and how open it was like in Southern Ontario there in, um, the, the, the forest there is a lot more sparse than it is up here. And the quality of the flights, like you got to watch the whole flight happen. Whereas when I'm hunting snowshoe hares, I miss a lot of it because it just, it, the boreal forest is just so thick that I'll see the initial flush of the hair and then I won't see anything until I could hear that the bird has caught the hair. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. You know, it's uh, like you still get to see a decent amount of the flight where we're at here, but you don't usually still like when, when you're hunting cottontails with red tails, it's you don't see the catch very often. You you see the flight, but you don't get to see the the actual catch, the bind, and and all that stuff. But yeah, I <laughs> I can say though that the majority of the time we we at least get to see the flight. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be I'm sure interesting to all of a sudden be like, oh, I my bird can actually fly. I I actually witnessed it happen. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh, your wings work. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that it's probably eye opening to actually get to see the different styles of flights and just what a bird can do. You know? Yeah. I really, I, yeah, I enjoyed that part of it a lot. And I, a lot of the time I hunt by myself. Um, so hunting with the rest of the club and, and new friends and old friends. And that was probably my favorite part of it. Um, because I'm usually just me and my dog and my bird and which I also love that too. Um, but it was really nice to hunt with other people. Yeah. I found that most people there that either, they either love or hate the social aspect of falconry. Like some people, they, they really only enjoy it if they're around other people. And then, you know, other people though, it's like their personal you know, thing, like they don't really want to share it with anybody. It's just, that's what they do for themselves. And, 
you know, it's it, like I said, it's interesting seeing how that changes over time with some people also. You know, some people that start off as social falconers, they end up going into isolation. And then some people, you know, it, it works the other way, <laughs> other way around. But yeah, I'd say for the most part, I, I, I love being me and the dog and the bird and the bunnies. And I, I love that, but I do it all the time. So, so when I went down and had this group of people who all loved doing the same thing, it was it was, yeah, it was magical. I, I really love that aspect of it. And then I came back and I also love being by myself hunting. <laughs> I'm not on anybody's timeline. I could hunt for as long as I want. I could go wherever I want. <laughs> yeah, it's, I know for me, I've, I've talked about it several times, but I, I, for me, it would be hard to comprehend a season where I wasn't getting out with a bunch of guys that weren't constantly telling me how much I suck, <laughs> you know, and, and just, and, and giving each other crap and stuff for, for me, that makes up a huge, you know, people listening will probably be like, okay, yeah, I see the appeal in that, you know, whatever. But, but no, it, it truly for me is like spending, you know, a handful of, of months or whatever with, with a group of guys and, and making those memories and stuff with other people, you know, good and bad, <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, you know, I mean, to me is, is just, a huge part of it and it wouldn't be as fulfilling for me personally if, if I didn't have that. But I certainly also admire people like yourself who uh, <laughs> have, I mean, they don't have really a choice. I mean, they have to go out by themselves or, is, or else they just don't do it at all. You know, so you know, hats off to you for, especially in the conditions that I've heard, you know, about you hunting in and things. Yeah, I mean, my hat's off to you for that, at least, you know. Oh, I've invited lots of people with me. And I do have a a group of friends that do enjoy doing it. But I would say the majority of people I take out for the first time don't ever come back. (laughs) I can't imagine why. I mean. (laughs) I don't know why either. (laughs) Yeah, well, before we before we get into that aspect of things, though, I mean, as far as your I mean, have you more of your background at least like as far as more of your background have you always been like an outdoorsy person i mean have you always been into hunting and and fishing and stuff or always from being a small child and my father taking us walleye fishing um and then as i grew up uh hunting um grouse with him and i've always been in love with the outdoors i as a child, actually, it's kind of funny. My mom always asked me, like, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'd always tell her, I just want to live with the wolves, mom. <laughs> She's like, well, that's not realistic. And I understand it's not realistic. <laughs> but I chose anything that I can do in the outdoors or to get me outside, I will do. So I'm still a big grouse hunter. Uh, archery hunt for deer. Archery hunt for moose. Um, obsessed with fishing obsessed with all kinds of fishing, walleye fishing, northern pike, steelhead, rainbow trout, or not rainbow trout, um, lake trout, everything. I love being outside. I love everything about it. When I went to school, I took fish and wildlife in British Columbia, and then I moved back to Thunder Bay, um, and I started working in forestry, and I was working a job. We would go out in the middle of the bush, we would spend 10 days, and then we'd come home for four. And the 10 days that I spent out in the bush, we were living in a tent and uh, collecting data on um, trees and soils and all sorts of different things. But when I would come back for my four days at home, I would grab my tent and I would go camping again. (laughs) We were like, well, you just spent 10 days out in the bush. Like, what are you doing? I said, yeah, that's what I want to (laughs) do. Nice. Yeah. I mean, like I said, it's, it's always interesting seeing what people's backgrounds are. I mean, I, I didn't have hardly any background hunting or much. I mean, my dad would try to take me when I was, when I was little and stuff, but it didn't really work out that well. Uh, (laughs) But uh, he he took me fishing and it seemed like, you know, when I was a kid, I, I remember I 
ended up falling out of the boat more than what I would catch. You know, it seemed like every excursion that my, my dad would take me fishing on, I'd somehow end up in the damn lake. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I guess that's more just me being a klutz as a kid. I also had really bad allergies, too, whenever I was a kid. And, uh, you know, I joke with people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I joke with people a lot. It's just like, you know, I think for the first 22 years of my life, I don't think I could breathe out of my nose. But, uh, you know, so, you know, the like what your heaven sounds like would have been my hell like the first you know, 20 years of my existence. But it's it's awesome that you found something so... I don't know, enriching, I guess, you know, at such a young age that you kind of had a direction. Yeah. And so I wanted my life, I wanted to spend every moment in the bush. So when I was, you know, growing up and thinking, okay, well, like, what am I going to do for work? It had to be something in the natural resources field. Like it had to be something outside. And then the funny thing about when falconry came into my life was I couldn't, work in forestry anymore. I couldn't be gone from home for 10 days. It's not like um, asking somebody to watch your dog while you're gone. Um, you know, just put the dog kibble in the bowl and you're all good. I couldn't do that with the hawks. So I did have to quit working in forestry um, in order to pursue falconry. Yeah, it's um, it can be a, a give and take for sure. Of course, you know, if you really wanted to, you could try and probably orchestrate things to where you know, you could do your research and your data collection stuff or whatever. And then you just have the bird perched outside. <laughs> it have a little, you know, mini weathering area outside your tent and just go and go hunting afterwards or something with what you know now, probably. <laughs> yeah, I, think I probably could. Given the chance, I think I would work in forestry again. Um, but I got a pretty sweet gig. I work at uh, my local pulp and paper mill and I work four on four off. So I have a ton of free time now. So yeah, and I get paid well. So that would be a hard one to leave. <laughs> well, I'm, and kind of thinking a little bit more about it too. It'd probably be hard to keep um, hawk food from going bad. You know, yeah, being and there. Will, yeah, probably wouldn't go so well. <laughs> so I don't feed my dogs raw food diet. <laughs> I can't <Yeah>. too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I I feel you. As we kind of were talking whenever we were first exchanging emails about setting this up too, like it can be really difficult giving up that those gaps of days off and stuff that you have, you know, working in healthcare, I, I do a, a similar type schedule and, and having, you know, three to four days off every week, even though they may not be consecutive days off, it can be hard to give that up. I mean, you get really used to that. Yeah. I work long shifts, 12 hour shifts. So that's hard. Like, especially in the winter time when it gets dark at 5 p.m. Um, it's not like I could go hunting after working 12 hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the same for me too, working 12 hours, but I mean, I'm night shift also. So, I mean, I've sleep deprivation and um, a uh, complete, like I don't even know what a circadian rhythm is anymore. Um, you know, that that's pretty much, I've, I can't even tell you how many hours of sleep that I've given up. Because, you know, I went basically straight from work to the field. I did. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, spend the whole morning basically. And then, yeah, it's like you crawl into bed, shut your eyes, get under the covers, and your alarm goes off. You sweep your legs back out. <laughs> and then, you know, it's like time to go back to work. And uh, so, yeah, but I mean, I, I get it. I totally get it. it. It's hard to give that up. Yeah, it is. I, when I was working night shift, I would go out a lot during the daytime, you know, the sleep as late as I could and then grab the bird, grab the snowshoes, snowshoe for four hours sometimes and then go work a 12 hour shift on my feet. Yeah, that was hard, <laughs> but it was worth it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You start dragging pretty hard. I know for yeah. me, for me, about three to four in the morning was always when I would usually hit the wall. Yeah. And um yeah, those last three hours or so, four hours would just be absolutely miserable. But uh, anyway, yeah. Um, no, that's cool, though. I mean, it, it sounds like, like I said, I, I, I can kind of relate to, you know, some of what, you know, your schedule and how you kind of go about things then, you know, so it's, like I said, it's neat having to always learn about like what other people have to like go through you know, to make their, to make their falconry work, 
you know, mm-hmm. around, around their, their, nor- well, I don't know if any of us have normal lives, but, um, you know, normal routines, I guess. So it's interesting. Yeah. I, I guess now would probably be a good time to kind of delve more into, cause I, I'm really fascinated by the type of falconry that you do. Cause I really know nothing about it. You know, I mean, sure. The red tail aspect of it. Sure. I've, I've flown red tails and all that, but I've never, you know, the only time I've ever seen snowshoe hairs have been in pictures, you know? So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, kind of describe your routine a little bit and how you deal with, with just the overall challenges of, of how you have to hunt. I mean, you have to go through a lot of crap. Yeah. So, well, maybe I'll start when I first, my first year, um, hunting with my male red tail, I had no idea how to find hairs. I knew they were around and you snowshoe around, you can see their tracks everywhere, but I literally had no idea how to find them. Um, but when I started in falconry, our snowshoe hair population was crazy. There was hairs everywhere. So I would, you know, go out with the bird, <clears throat> strap my snowshoes on, throw them up in a tree, and I would just walk. And I'm like walking in circles. And the first year, um, I'd be walking, <clears throat> and this red tail is just coming out of these trees and trying to grab these hairs all over the place. And I was like, what is going This is wild. And I remember uh, messaging my sponsor, and I was like, he's just flying everywhere. Like there, there's hairs everywhere. He's chasing them everywhere. I have no idea what is going on. I can't see them for the most part because they're running away from me. Um, and they're running away from him. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is wild. Like I got to figure out how to do this. And we caught one hair in my first season, um, which was crazy. He was learning how to catch them. Uh, I trapped storm, from Southern Ontario where they don't have snowshoe hairs. So it was probably the first time he ever saw a white rabbit. Uh, so he was learning how to do it. A lot of the time when we first started, <clears throat> he would come out of the tree. I would think that he's going to get the hair and then he would pull up at the last second. I'm like, okay, well, what, why is he doing that? Like, why isn't he like fully committing and, um, trying to grab this thing he would just pull up and then I started to think like I think he thinks they're too big and some of the hairs here are really large so it's like okay maybe that's it but once he figured out what, what when he caught his first one um the next season he was on fire there was no pulling up over the hairs he was fully committing to every single one Um, And our second year, there was a ton of hairs still. Our third year, still a lot. And this past year was horrible. There was so many lynx. Every spot that I'd go to would just be littered with lynx tracks. And where I, you know, years before, I'd be snowshoeing for um, an hour, two hours. I'd have maybe nine flushes. Um, I was maybe in two hours having one, um, sometimes none. And I was like, oh, okay, this is a total bummer. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, I think that this next season coming up, I think it's either going to be the same or, or worse, um, which I'm kind of bummed out about. Um, but snowshoe hairs are cyclic, right? So it's to be expected. <laughs> Did you have to work through any like weight issues with that too? Did you experiment with having to, you know, drop weight to see if maybe he just wasn't wanting to commit with, you know, grabbing because he was a little too fat or anything? Or did you? Yeah, was, no, was, I, I would lower him. I would, I would raise his weight up and it was still the same thing. And I think he, I honestly think it was just his confidence. If you've gone through those stages, then yeah, I mean, it, it sounds to me like that's, yeah, probably was going on too. I, you know, I'm sure that was probably frustrating for you though. You know, I mean, I know how frustrating that can be for sure. Had to, well, especially when you're yeah on snowshoes for four hours, six hours, sometimes <laughs> like, holy man. Okay. Just grab one of these. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can imagine, you know, with 
the the type of conditions and as much effort and time as you're as you're putting in, you know, to basically yeah, basically looking like you know Jack Nicholson at the end of The Shining, where he's like a oh, frozen yeah. icicle. You know, I can I can imagine. You know, I would be probably getting pretty pissed myself. But uh, you know, I mean, that's like I said though. I mean, that's it's great that you stuck with it and not only stuck with it, but stayed committed to it and stayed loving it. I mean, that, that sounds like conditions to me where a lot of people would either completely just not want to do it anymore or, you know, whatever. So, I mean, that's, that's awesome though. Yeah. I think it's not for everybody. That's for, <laughs> I think I'm a special person <laughs> yeah. for actually enjoying it as much as I do. And I do, I do love hunting on the snowshoes and I love hunting snowshoe hares. <laughs> Did you uh, have any, any kind of uh, doubts at all during that first season? Like what the hell am I doing? Yeah. Um, not doubts for me doing it. I guess maybe doubts for like, am I doing something wrong? Like mm. why, why can't he catch these things? Is it my fault? Is it something I'm doing? Um, but once we figured it out, well, once he figured it out, I guess, um, no, it's the greatest thing. I just, I can't imagine myself not doing this, not hunting snowshoe hares at minus 25 with six feet of snow on the ground, <laughs> still going down your back every time you go underneath a tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It sounds like heaven. <laughs> yeah no that's that's great though i mean it's awesome that that your natural environment works so well for your personality and your interests that's really awesome it, it's not the same for everybody you know i mean no not, not everybody's fortunate enough to automatically just mesh with with all of that you know it takes some people i think longer sometimes to figure that out so that's awesome yeah it was with the population of hares, though, at the beginning was okay. They were everywhere. So I was like, oh, this is unbelievable. But once the population started going down, then I had to, you know, learn a lot more. Like, where am I going to find them? Yeah, there's tracks everywhere and I'm snowshoeing everywhere, but I'm not seeing anything. Then you start to have to learn how to actually track a hare. Because the, the hares could be moving, you know, 70 yards in front of you. You can't see them. But it, it, it's helpful when we have a, like a fresh snowfall because then you can tell which tracks are the old tracks from the night before, or days before, and then which tracks are from right now. And where is this hare going? And how do I get there? And how do I get the bird in the right position uh, above it? to be able to see it because the boreal forest is very thick. Like it's hard to see, I guess, from the bird's perspective, hard to see down through it if we're hunting an area that's just too thick. And that's where the hares are going to be because they're safe there. So we have to learn how to get them out of those extremely thick patches of balsam fir or cedar or whatever, whatever it happens to be, um, and try to get them to go in the open, which snowshoe hares do not do. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And it's, like I said, that's kind of a far cry from a lot of the habitat that, you know, jackrabbits and stuff have out West because they are at a lot of times just in the wide open and the only thing they yeah. have is their maneuvers you know i watch and, those videos and i want to cry sometimes <laughs> <What? laughs> this is insane our only open spaces up here are either roadways lakes rivers that's it the rest is bush <laughs> hmm. So uh, did you decide then to somehow, I mean, is it possible to incorporate like a dog where you're at then? I mean, did you decide to start hunting with the dog or is it just too deep or the snow just too deep for, for them to get around? Or, I mean, did you, what, what other stuff did you kind of come up with to kind of, you know, conquer some of those other like terrain challenges? Yeah. So when I first started, I did not have a traditional falconry or hunting dog at all. I had a husky retriever mutt that um, she has a really high prey drive. And I thought, well, I'm just going to try. 
I'm going to bring her out because why not hunt the bird and walk your dog at the same time? So I would take her out and it was amazing. She ended up being um, an amazing snowshoe hair dog. She, you know, didn't have like the stamina of regular hunting dogs or um, anything like that, but she would stick close and she had a good nose. So she'd be able to find hairs that were like uh, burrowed deep in the snow and be able to get them to come out, which was a huge um, help for sure. And then, but as the winter would progress and the snow would get deeper, it would be a lot harder for her. And now that she's aging, she ended up blowing out both of her ACLs. So she currently does not hunt with me anymore, which is sad. Um, So I ended up, I guess a year ago, I got a Brittany Spaniel puppy and I hunted her for the first time uh, this past season and she's incredible. Um, just can go for days. It didn't matter if the snow was one inch deep or six feet deep. She went through it and could still, you know, go for a couple hours after it was incredible. I'm like, okay, if I have to do less work snowshoeing and the dog could do it, I'm going to do that. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's the point that most guys that end up with dogs, basically they, they have their own like what I call like personal come to Jesus, you know, meeting with, uh, with themselves, just like, look, all right, I'm dealing with this terrain. Either I'm always going to have to rely on a group of guys getting out with me to get game up to have for my bird to have a real chance to get it. Or I can go through the initial growing pains of getting a dog or two going. And I can just eventually get to the point where I can sit back and watch them work. Mm-hmm. I mean, I could almost crack open a beer and then just, you know, just sit there and, and, uh, you know, have a nice stout or something while, you know, my bird is hunting over my <laughs> dogs. And, and, um, I can tell you that now having kind of almost gotten to that point, I know which one I would prefer, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, some guys, there's, there's guys that I hunt with that just do not like dogs. They don't like, you know, having dogs being, or, you know, around them very much. They certainly don't want to incorporate them into their falconry, but it makes me wonder if, if it would change at all, if they didn't have a choice, but to always hunt by themselves too. Yeah. And you know what? Sometimes when we're hunting, I see the value of the dog because I get to do less work. But then I see the value in hunting without the dog, especially for snowshoe hares, because they rely so much on their camel. They will literally just sit still and not move. But if you have the dog, then they're just running all over the place. But if you don't have the dog, you can actually set up the flight much better without the dog being there. Um, If I can snowshoe up and find one sitting, you know, underneath a little balsam tree or something and they'll sit still. You could, I've gotten so close within like inches of these hairs um, because they're just, you can't see me. They're just sitting there. Um, So I see the value in both. Uh, It's hard. I, I prefer to hunt with my dog because I like to hunt with my dog. Um, and she gets to get out and, and get exercise and stuff. And, but I, I do see the value in not having the dog and setting up the flights myself and tracking the hair myself. And especially if we have a missed flush on a hair, um, the bird will go back up into a tree and the dog's going to still look for that hair. So she's running around and she's following its tracks. So when I try to find the reflush or try to locate the hair again, she's completely destroyed the tracks and I can't see um, where the fresh hair tracks go. So sometimes that gets a little frustrating, (laughs) but uh, when I'm snowshoeing in six feet of snow, it's much nicer having the dog. (laughs) This is going to say, you just have to kind of pick and choose your your evils, I guess. Um, yeah. You know, which it either way, it doesn't sound like I, I know which one probably which version, if I was in your shoes would be more evil to me, I guess. But, uh, you know, like I said, not everybody's the same, but you know, I mean, I, 
I can't imagine now, you know, like having put the work and the the time, effort, and energy into watching the progression of, you know, a, a dog, and you know, getting to a point where you you finally get to the point where you want to be, and not having that again. In other words, like, I, can you imagine like having to completely go without a uh, hunting dog again? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> especially with the hair population decreasing as much as it is. Um, like these things hide in this subnivian layer under these fortresses of, you know, overhanging trees that snow is being piled on, piled on, piled on. And the hairs will sit under there. Um, and I'm not going to get them out there. Like there's, I could be poking around my stick all over the place and like the thing's not coming out, but the dog, they're able to pinpoint exactly where in the snow the, the rabbit is and, you know, try to dig through and then this, the hair will pop up. So it's, I, I find my falconry is more enjoyable with a dog and I don't think I, I would do it without one. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it'd be indispensable, you know, where you're at, especially, but my sponsor who's three hours North of me, there are areas that he can't hunt his dogs Um, he hunts with beagles, but he can't hunt because of the wolves Mm. and he has lost dogs to wolves. Mm. And there's, there's that too. Um, one thing I really like about the Brittany Spaniel is she actually hunts really close to me. Um, but there are those dangers also around here. Uh, I've never, uh, encountered them, but, uh, I hope I never do. Um, but they are there. So that's the other thing. You got to watch what the bird's doing. You got to make sure the dog's safe and and stuff like that. So it's quite chaotic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, where I'm at, we don't really have wolves to, to deal with, but we do have a lot of coyotes. And and um, yeah, I, I can imagine with a dog like a beagle that doesn't want to listen and naturally come back, you know, how that would be a, definitely a consideration. I didn't even think about that. You know, I'm... I forget how far north you all are. I'm sure <laughs> you guys have a lot more of that to deal with. Yeah. And so when I hunt with him, I, I don't bring my dogs there at all. It, like there's, yeah, he's got a lot of wolves for sure and not worth it. But then, and then it's nice that I don't have the dog to hunt with. And then, you know, you're just relying on ourselves and uh, tracking hairs and okay, is this the fresh track or is this the fresh track or follow it this way or uh, yeah. So I like both, I guess. I don't know. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel you. Well, I mean, are there any other like big challenges that you have to kind of work with or, or work around, I guess? I mean, I, it's a good thing your bird can, can handle, you know, the hairs well enough whenever, he does catch him because I imagine it's probably pretty hard to run in a snowshoe suit. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah, you're just yelling, hold on, hold on, while I trip over a tree and my snowshoe has got a big stick stuck through it. And then you got to, well, you go face first and there's six feet of snow. So when your arms go in, you're up to your face. <laughs> yeah. So that, that part's hard. It's like, okay, I'm going to get there as soon as I can. One cool thing I noticed about hares is if the, if the bird catches them, um, you know, they're always going to want to catch them by the head, but that doesn't happen all the time. So if the bird catches a hare while it's going into a burrow or something like that, so it's got it by the back end, as long as the hare's head is under snow, it doesn't make a noise. So it's just hard for me to find exactly where are they? Like, I know we went in this direction, but like, where are you? I have no idea. The hair is not making a noise. His bell's not making a noise because I put it on the leg and it's in the snow. It's not making noise. So sometimes it's like, okay, now I got to get my telemetry out. Now this is going to take way longer for me to even get to you guys. Just hang on. (laughs) I'm coming. (laughs) So yeah. Yeah. Moving quickly is not easy. And Lots of the time you need to get there quick because if the bird has the hair by the back end and it's tunneling into the snow, it's pulling the bird into the snow with it. And a lot of the times they're going to, you know, go up against like a little bush or like a branch or something and they're going to wipe the bird right off and then the, the hair is gone. And for the most part, if the hair is 
almost been caught or been grabbed by the hawk, it's almost impossible to get that hair to come back out again. Like, again, it has, they're underneath six feet of snow in these little layers, we call them, <laughs> of overhanging trees and stuff. And, and they'll tunnel um, through the snow, maybe 20, 30 yards, and then pop out somewhere else. And like, you'll have no idea where, where that even was or how to find that hair again. But lots of the times if they've almost been caught or, or been grabbed by them, they're impossible to get back out for a reflush, which is frustrating after you snowshoed for two hours to find that one hair and then you can never find it again. But a lot at sometimes, you know, you could reflush a hair three or four times. And it's like, okay, <laughs> come on. <laughs> I can only imagine how mad I would be, you know, if I, if I got up there and, you know, birds, you know, has wings splayed out, just trying not to go deeper in the snow and stuff and reach down in there and thinking it might still have a hold of something and then, you know, come up empty handed and stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, oh, darn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so by red tail, he, he will pout for like a half hour, sometimes 40 minutes where he will not hunt again because, you know, he's got a mitt full of fur. Um, and he thinks that he should have had that and he doesn't and he and he'll sit there and he will not hunt with me so you know let him just chill for a little while and sometimes for the rest of that outing he he won't hunt again most of the time it takes him about a half an hour so I just kind of chill out for a bit and I'll snowshoe around and let him sit in that spot and I'll try to you know look to see where did it go so I could set up for the next flight which is going to be in half an hour when he's done <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's I've seen my red tails do that, you know, with bunnies and squirrels both, and it can be annoying to, you know, a little bit cuz you do get them a, a couple other decent slips or something and they'll just, you know, <laughs> for whatever reason they'll just be still in their own head and yeah, yeah, it's I mean, out of curiosity though, does your dog or does your bird allow your dog to help with catches at all? I mean, does your dog ever kind of make in and try and grab the rabbit while your bird's got it or anything? Both my dogs are actually very respectful of the bird. Um, I think they're both a little terrified of the bird, um, <laughs> but they love hunting with him. But uh, when I first started hunting with my little husky mutt, um, she would go up to them and w actually this one time I was uh, hunting in this pretty thick stand, um, young balsam fir stand and with really large poplar trees. And so I watched the dog run through this patch and I can't see the rabbit obviously because it's too thick, but the bird is coming out of a tall tree and I could see like he's, he's going to get this thing. And sure enough, I could hear he's got the hair. And the dog's way faster than I am. So the dog is at him quicker. So I push through this balsam stand and I get to the bird and the dog. The bird is holding the hair by the head and the dog is holding the back legs for him. <laughs> okay, that's teamwork. Way to go. <laughs> Thanks for helping. And he didn't mind her holding the hair. She wasn't trying to steal the hair or anything like that. Um, she was just holding on to it. And I was like, that's incredible that you guys are, uh, working together this well, because my bird is notorious for hating dogs. He will not allow, uh, strange dogs in the field at all. And when I first got the new puppy, um, he had a really hard time with her because she's just this little ball of energy running around and he's used to my pretty, uh, you know, chill hussy puppy that's not doing too much. Uh, so he had a hard time with her at first, but once he started seeing that she was flushing these hairs and she didn't care when he caught them, when, when he would be on a hair, the puppy would just want to find more bunnies. She didn't care that he had that one. So she would totally leave him alone, which was amazing. And I'm very happy, um, because I don't think that's any fun, you know, having a dog that's going to try to steal from the bird and then you got to worry that you know they're going to get a talon in the eye or something <laughs> <laughs> i just that that would be too much and then i wouldn't want to hunt with the dog anymore so i'm lucky that i haven't had any issues like that and i know people have had um so i'm happy that i haven't yeah and and whenever you initially got 
the newer puppy, did you just socialize the dog with the bird in the typical way? I mean, perch them inside a lot, make them spend a lot of time around each other. Or how did you initially socialize them together to get them used to each other? Um, so when I got the new puppy, I was actually like pretty far into my season. I think I, I got rain when it was like December 21st or something. So I was actively hunting with the red tail already. Um, and she was too small to hunt. She was seven weeks old or eight weeks old or whatever she was. So she was way too young, but I would, uh, I'd bring her out with us, um, not in the bush, but I would bring her in the car all the time and in her crate and I would take her out. And when we would get back, um, from the field with a successful hunt, I would let her play with the hair and stuff to get her, you know, really enjoying what we were doing. And he was very apprehensive of her, you know, wings out, uh, didn't want her anywhere near him. It didn't matter how much time they spent together. I had to have him perched in the house or whatever. And he, it seemed like he did not like her. And I was like, Oh, this is, this is not going to be good. Um, and then I interviewed him. And so she sees this dog running around the yard and his, the muse windows are facing where she's running around all the time. And I think it was that, that he kind of maybe started to accept her like, okay, I see this dog all the time. She's not messing with me or whatever. And then, um, when we started this season, it was the first day I hunted snowshoe hares. Um, so the first time they hunted together, I honestly didn't know what to expect. I threw the bird up in a tree and I thought, you know what? I just, I don't care if we catch anything or not. Like this is just the first introduction with these two because he is so notorious for hating dogs in the field that I thought he's either going to fly away somewhere far or, or do something weird, but he didn't. He followed her and she's just running around. She has no clue what she's doing. She's running around. Um, we were in this um, young tamarack stand. So the trees were only maybe six feet tall. Yeah, six feet tall, something like that. And he's up in this real big poplar. And I see she's running through a patch of thick goldenrod. And uh, she kind of goes around the goldenrod to the back of the tamarack stand, comes through the tamarack stand. I think that's how it happened. Yeah, through the tamarack stand and back to the goldenrod. And I see Storm sitting in the tree and his head just moves. And I'm like, oh, there's got to be something there. And he just comes barreling out of this tree and just jumps right on top of this hair. And I could hear, I'm like, oh my God, he, they just caught their first rabbit together. <laughs> I'm like, I did not expect that. I think we've been hunting for like five minutes or something. I was like, wow, that was wild. Um, there was no snow on the ground yet. Then the leaves were still mostly on the trees. So it was pretty thick, but I was like, okay, this is going to be awesome. Our first five minute hunt <laughs> of the year. And they got a hair. And then it was like a month between that first hair and my second hair this season. And oh, it was, so they, they hunted well together, um, between the first hair and the second hair. Um, it just, we weren't finding as many. So I think, I don't know, it was that first initial one that the bird was like, oh, okay, this dog's going to do something cool for me, so I'm just going to follow her. And most of the times I'd go out with them, and, like, she's so fast, the dog is so fast that you know, she's just, she's gone looking for bunnies, and I'm way in the back, like, okay, hold on, wait for me. <laughs> so I think, yeah, I, it was maybe that first catch, and then he was totally fine with her, and she's always respected his space and doesn't care that he's on a rabbit. She just wants to find more. So they did well. I was very impressed. <laughs> very nice. Yeah. I mean, was that one of the most memorable, like, you know, kind of stories that, that you have as far as, uh, I mean, do you have um, any other like memories that you have that stand out more so than the others as far as a, a particular hunting story or anything or? Um, yeah, I have a lot, but I think one from this past season, um, I started to get lazy. I started not wanting to drive to really far places. And I actually started just hunting in my backyard. I live out in the country. Um, my neighbor has about 100 acres or something like that, that she allows me to hunt on. 
and there's a hydro line that splits our two properties. <clears throat> so I would go in between her property and my property all the time. So I just was, you know, losing motivation. We were going out all the time, not seeing any hairs, you know, there's sign, you know, there's bunnies here, but not like hunt after hunt after hunt after hunt, not coming home with a hair. It was uh, starting to get pretty sad. And actually this was after I came home from Southern Ontario, um, hunting cottontails, I think it was my first hunt back home after that. And so I strapped my snowshoes on. It was nice. I won't drive anywhere. Just walk in the backyard. And I think we were hunting for about two hours. There's hair tracks everywhere, but we're not seeing anything. And then, so we crossed over the hydro line and I crossed over the hydro line and I'm walking and I'm like, Hey, this is weird. There are fresh hair tracks that cross this hydro line, which hairs never do ever. They never go in this wide open like this. I'm like, this has to have been from like last night or something. And then I could see the tracks. They go across the hydro line and then they loop back, cross the hydro line back to the same spot. And I was like, okay, I don't know, just try go in this area. And so the dog was in front of me and she enters the bush line on the other side of the hydro line. And, um, I see this hair right in front of her. So she, she knew it was there. She flushed the hair and the thing kind of whatever, I couldn't see it. It went off. So I'm following behind her and she gets the hair up again. And the thing is just going in circles, going in circles. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, and she's right on it. And what that, I think that was the first time that she started sounding on hairs which I was like, okay, that's awesome. So now I know when she's got one right in front of her that it is an actual bunny or whatever. Um, and so she's sounding on this hair and it's running in circles, running in circles and, and the bird is trying to get it, but it's in this patch that's just way too thick. So he'd come out of the tree and he would try to penetrate through, but then he wouldn't. He would just like bank up and it's just too thick in there. And then so she's running in circles. I'm trying to like follow this chaos and, um, she finally flushes it one more time and it goes all the way across the hydro line again. And I was like, this is wild. So I just stood there. I watched the, the rabbit, you know, crossing the hydro line. I watched the dog right on the rabbit's tail. And then I'm just watching storm come out of the tree and just like a bullet straight directly to this hair. I seen the whole flight and he just grabs it right on the other side of the hydro line. And I was like, yes, <laughs> <laughs> oh, success. And it felt so good because I think at that time I had only caught like four or five maybe hairs so far in the season. And this is like later January. So I only have a couple more months before our season's over. And uh, it, it was one of the most satisfying catches that we had just because I got to watch the whole thing and the the dog working with the bird and the bird work yeah yeah it was magical awesome well perfect yeah well, I mean out of curiosity too uh, is there another species that you'd like to fly eventually other than just a red tail or are you pretty much you know are you pretty much satisfied or, or cool with just flying red tails you know I I love flying red tails I I think they work well. They work really well for for this area and this quarry that we're hunting. Um, like my red tail will hunt in anything as long as it's not colder than minus twenty five, which that's Celsius. So I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but uh, that's pretty cold. Like minus twenty five is really cold. Um, he'll hunt in anything up to that. So like they're hardy. I, I, they work well. They work well for me now, but I do want to try goshawk. And I did actually get a permit to trap a goshawk this season. So I'm working on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm keeping the red tail. I was actually going to release him, but with the state of our population of hares um, and me not knowing anything about trapping a goshawk, um, if I am not successful in trapping one, well, then I still have him to hunt hares. So, so I'm going to hold on to him for a little while. 
Well, and not only that, but I mean, with you not knowing if the populations of hares are going to be down to, it's going to be more important to also have an experienced bird, you know, like yeah. that knows the yeah. game. Exa- exactly. Starting a new bird with the population the way it is right now, I, it's just, it's not smart, I don't think. Um, so I don't know, starting with goshawk, but yeah. I'm up for the challenge. I'm excited. <laughs> I hope I hope I do catch one. I don't know. I've been talking to a lot of people trying to figure out how I'm going to go about this. Um, so I hope it happens. But gotcha. Well, best of luck to you on that. You know, I uh, <laughs> like I said, I've I've um, you know been watching goshawks fly since I got into falconry. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm sure I'll fly one at some point, but. You know, like I said, it's it's kind of one of those things where I've I've come close a couple times, but you know, I get my fill from of that from watching all my like pretty much all the guys I hunt with fly goshawks. So it's like, you know, yeah. But I mean, I, I if I if I got one, I'd want to fly them on squirrels. You don't have the headache to deal with. No, go hunt with their birds. <laughs> no, no, I, I I watch them have it all and whenever they're struggling and you know they look at me and and ask me you know you know it's like you know you want one i'm like mm-hmm. i think i'm I think i'm all right for a while you know but uh but yeah it's each their own like i said if that's what you want to do next that's awesome you know i i hope it works out for you and um i before we end i i want to do uh what i have been doing and i know from your perspective it, it's i'm sure that you know, it's going to be a uh, kind of a different uh, approach or angle, but like, you know, I've been asking people what, what piece of advice do you think is, is the best that you would want to pass on to people just getting into the sport or have been in the sport for a while? I mean, you're, like I said, your obstacles and your approach to everything's kind of different. So I'm kind of interested to see what, what piece of advice you'd like to leave for people. My advice would be for for new falconers um, would be not to compare yourself um, to other people's falconry because, you know, social media is, is a weird thing like that. I would, especially my first couple of years when we weren't as successful, um, you know, I'd compare myself to cottontail hunters and I can't, I'm not hunting cottontails. I'm hunting snowshoe hares. It's not the same thing, but it would, it would get me really down. Like, you know, I think like, oh, am I just, am I not doing something right? Or is there something wrong with me or whatever? Um, and it would, you know, it would uh, impact, um, you know, how I felt. And then I started to realize, well, like, why am I comparing myself to other people? Like I shouldn't or, or other people's falconry. I said, like, um, I'm not the same. I'm totally different. What I'm dealing with what I have to deal with, how I have to deal with it is it's just not the same. So I think that would be my piece of advice is, you know, make your falconry your own and don't compare yourself to anybody else. Well, I was right in my suspicion because that's, like I said, that's a perspective that I think that a lot of people, you know, might have, but they haven't really shared yet. So I think that that's a good way to to end on. And I think that's a great piece of advice because I think it's a, it's a trap that we fall into to some degree. And, um, you know, what, what's mine is yours or what's mine is not necessarily yours and vice versa. And, um, yeah, I mean, you, you never know what other people are dealing with and you also don't really know what the, what the true, stories are you know sometimes whenever you're dealing with things especially like social media and everything so i think that's it's a great piece of advice and um like i said thank you again so much for taking the time to do this i'm I'm glad that we could coordinate it but i mean like i said thank you again so much i I really appreciate you know your time and and um, i'm glad that i'm been able to kind of coordinate doing this to kind of give canada some some representation and uh you know, people have been asking for it for a while, but you know, we could, we, are, we only do so much. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm super honored to be here. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. And you know, like I said, I hopefully we'll get a chance to meet in person sometime and who knows, maybe I'll get a chance to later on down the road, attend, you know, one of those meets or something. I'd like to see what you all are doing up there. 
Yeah, there's an open invitation and I got an extra pair of snowshoes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, I it's something I I'm always down to experience um, you know, different versions of of the different rings of falconry hell at least once. Yeah. You know, so I'm I would uh, I would love to sometime and I, I appreciate that. So like I said, I appreciate you and we'll go ahead and um, call this good. Thanks.